Hey, good morning, Coastal Church. Pastor Sean here, and I wanted to take a minute and just address all the campuses and, and announce our Christmas series, just introduce you to what we're gonna be doing over the Christmas series. And so, you know, if you remember back to the Nehemiah series, we uh, started the series by praying. Remember how Nehemiah prayed? And I said, hey, we wanna be a church that prays. And one of the things I asked you to pray for was to list some people that maybe to your knowledge, didn't know Christ, didn't have a relationship with God. And so just to begin to pray for them. Well, guess what? Uh, we're in the Christmas season and we have our Christmas Eve service coming up in just a few weeks. And it's gonna be a great service and we're gonna share the gospel. And one of the things I love about our culture is people, for whatever reason, think they should go to church on Christmas. And I think that's, uh, I think that's fantastic. And so we're gonna equip you with some invite cards. And I really wanna encourage you, take that list of people that you've been praying for and take a, as many invite cards to our Christmas Eve services you will give away and invite them out to the Christmas Eve service. We're gonna share the gospel. It's gonna be a candlelight service. It's gonna be a great service and we would love for them to come. And so I just wanted to put that in the back of your mind. Be praying in these next couple of weeks. Grab some invite cards and invite the people you've been praying for to come out and join us for worship on Christmas Eve. Secondly, I wanna to announce to you our, our Christmas series. Really, really excited about this series. Uh, and you know, it's interesting how each of the gospel writers approaches the Christmas story differently. But one of the ways that's unique, one of the things that's unique to the Gospel of Matthew is he actually starts the Christmas story with a genealogy. And a lot of times when we're reading the Christmas story, we just read through that real quickly. But uh, it's really actually quite interesting. I mean, if you and I went on Ancestry.com and we found out that we had someone famous or someone of nobility in our family tree, we would certainly shout that from the rooftops, let everybody know uh, the descent, where we came from. But and Matthew has some of those, of course. He's got the patriarchs and he's got David. Uh, but you know, there's some characters buried in the genealogy that I don't think if they were in our family tree, we would want everyone to know about that. And so myself and the pastors, as we began to pray about the Christmas series, we were asking the question, why are some of these characters, characters like Bathsheba, Rahab, why are they in the genealogy of Jesus? And we concluded that it's all about grace. God in his grace uses broken people to exalt the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's so encouraging to me. And I hope that's encouraging to you that God uses people just like you and I, just like Rahab, just like Bathsheba, to be a part of what God is doing on the planet until the day that our faith becomes sight. And so I hope that you're encouraged as we unpack some of these characters out of the genealogy of the birth of Christ in this new series we're doing over the, over the month of December, The Unlikely Family Tree. Merry Christmas to everybody. Yeah, that didn't sound very merry. All right, you guys wanna try that again? You wanna do better? Okay, Merry Christmas, everybody. All right, good. It's great to have you. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 1. If you have your Bible, Matthew 1. Actually, we're gonna, I'm going to have you put your finger in Matthew 1, uh, and then we're actually going to park in Genesis 38, believe it or not. So Matthew 1, start there, flip over to Genesis 38, and uh, yeah, we're going to talk about the unlikely uh, family tree of Christ. How many of you have an Ancestry.com account? Anybody? couple of you guys? Yeah, I, I've always wanted to do that. I need to do that. I love family history, right? And we probably, if you know anything about your family history, you probably found somebody in your family history that like is the family favorite, right? Everybody likes to brag about someone famous in their family tree. Uh, I've told you guys this a million times, but my wife is actually a descendant of Martin Luther, the reformer, right? And so huge family tree of followers of Jesus, and, and I love that. But, uh, but we also have people in our family tree we don't want other people to know about, right? And everybody's got like the crazy uncle, you know, like, yeah, yeah, they're in the family. I realized over Thanksgiving, um, I think I might be the crazy uncle to the other children because my sister-in-law was like, we prepared the kids that you were coming. And so I was like, man, I'm the problem, actually. So, uh, so anyway, but we all have people in our family tree that maybe we wouldn't like to talk about, right? And, and because it, somehow in our culture, and certainly in cultures past, like where you came from was often a defining moment. Uh, but Christ in his humility, and, and so the four Gospels all approach Christmas from a little bit of a different angle. And what's interesting in Matthew is Matthew actually starts the Christmas story 
uh, with a genealogy of the descendants of Christ. Like who are, who's his family heritage? And it's important because the gospel of Matthew is written to the Jews. Uh, That's the audience of the gospel of Matthew. And so it was very important for the Jews to understand that the Messiah is a descendant of both Abraham because of the Abrahamic covenant and David because of the Davidic covenant. Everybody with me? And so this genealogy to the target audience of Matthew was incredibly important. And in Old Testament times, you would, in ancient Near Eastern culture, the norm would be to list the men in the genealogy. However, in the genealogy of Christ, there are four women listed. And the four women are, are all Gentiles, all right? So to a Jewish audience, this all would have been like, man, this is amazing. Like, what are, what are we doing here? How can we even trust that Jesus is the Messiah, right? And so the four women listed are, are Tamar and Rahab, and we're going to cover them in the next two weeks, Bathsheba and Ruth, okay? So we're going to cover three of them, and then week number four will be Christmas Eve. We're going to talk about Mary, okay, the, the mother of Jesus. So we're going to cover those four characters, and it's really an unusual Christmas story, right? A genealogy for the Christmas story. And a couple of these stories are so entangled in sin that it's shocking that these people are listed in the genealogy of Christ, okay? So let's pick up in Matthew chapter 1. Here we go. You ready? Matthew 1, 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, okay? So Matthew is writing to an audience trying to show that Jesus is indeed the Messiah, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, who is the, what's it say, church? The son of who? David, the Davidic covenant. The son of who? Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant. And now he gets into the genealogy, verse 2. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was the father of Jacob. And Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. Now, how many of y'all, as I'm reading this, go, I recognize these names? How many of you raise your hand? Probably most of you, right? You've read enough, heard enough about the Bible. Okay, now it gets weird, okay? Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah by, and this is the first female listed, by their mom, Tamar. And Perez was the father of Hezron, and Hezron was the father of Ram, okay? So I'm going to stop there. And I'm going to tell you the genealogy, okay? So Perez, who is fathered by Judah and Tamar, has a son named Hezron, who has a son named Ram, who has a son named Amimadad, who has a son named Nashon, who has a son named Salmon. How many are like, I haven't heard of any of these, right? Raise your hand if you haven't heard of any of these. Me either, right? But Salmon has a son named Boaz. Anybody heard of Boaz? Right, Boaz and Ruth, Right? And Boaz and Ruth have a son named Obed. Anybody heard of the name Obed? He's like, it's getting a little more familiar because Obed had a son named, anybody know? Jesse, right? Good. So Jesse had a son named David. So you guys get the lineage, all right? So with that as kind of backdrop, I'm going to ask the question, how did Perez get here? Because it goes from names we know all the way to Judah to a name I've never heard of, a guy named Perez. So now we're going to get to how in the world did Perez get here, all right? So now I want you to flip over to Genesis 38, and this is actually where I'm going to preach out of this morning, Genesis 38. Genesis 38 seems like a misplaced chapter in the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis, a third of the book of Genesis is the life of Joseph, And the life of Joseph starts in chapter 37. And the next 13 chapters, except for 38, is how Joseph seems to do everything right in following God. He always makes the right choice, even if it includes suffering. And God blesses him and God uses him, right? You know the story, how he interprets dreams. He ends up in Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife lies. He ends up in jail, right? He in jail, he interprets, he does the right thing. He rises up in leadership in the prison. Eventually, Pharaoh has a dream. The bread baker and the cup bearer, they're like, oh, we know this guy who interprets dreams. Pharaoh brings Joseph up. Joseph interprets the Pharaoh's dream, right? That he had this dream. Like, There's going to be seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. 
you need to prepare for the seven years of famine. He comes up with a plan, and Egypt, through Joseph's wisdom and dream interpretation, becomes the second in charge, and is and Egypt becomes this very powerful nation, right? So that's this whole like 12 or 13 chapters. But sandwiched in there is chapter 38. It's this one chapter that cuts over to the life of Judah. And I really think it's there to kind of as a juxtaposition to the life of Joseph. This story is so full of sin, it's embarrassing. It's so full of sin, it's not suitable for children. This is not the story that you do in family devotions. Like, hey, circle up, guys. Let's hear about the life of Judah, okay? And, 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 and so I'm going to try to PG it for you this morning and then pull out a couple truths, all right? So here it is, Genesis 38, 1. And I'm only going to read verse 1, and I'm going to read verse 26, okay? So verse 1, so chapter 37 the brothers sell Joseph into slavery, and now Joseph's story, this branch of the working of God, begins to take place. But for a minute, the author Moses transitions us back to Judah and says, hey, let's pick up with Judah. I want to hear. I want you to understand what Judah's doing while Joseph is over here and God's preparing him to be a great leader, okay? And so in chapter 1, of verse 1 of 38, and it happened at that time that Judah went down from his brother's. It's very, very important, by the way. It's saying that on the earth at the time, the only people that really believed in God were the children of Israel, of Jacob, right? So it's a small family. They're followers of God. And listen, they're a broken mess too, but they're the only ones looking to the true and living God, okay? And Judah leaves them and goes into a foreign land, and he becomes friends, turns aside to a certain Adulamite whose name is Hira. Okay, so I could preach a whole sermon, and I talked about this last week. Show me your five closest friends. I'll show you the person you're becoming, okay? And so Judah chooses ungodly friends, people that are not worshiping the true and the living God. He leaves his community and his family. He goes on to marry a person, a woman who's not a follower of God, an unbeliever. Remember when we were in Nehemiah, and we talked about marriage and that according to the scriptures, as Christians, we're to marry in the faith. We're to find another follower of Jesus to marry. And so, but Judah marries an unbeliever, and they have children together, and these children do not follow in the ways of God. The first son is a guy by the name of Ur, E-R, Ur, okay? He marries, who marries Tamar. So this is where Tamar enters the picture. Ur marries Tamar, and they have no children, and Ur is rebellious against the Lord, and so the Lord kills him. It's the perfect verse for any of you with daughters who have somebody that wants to marry your daughter. Like, hey, if you don't treat my girl right, real chance, God will strike you dead. Okay, so it's in the Bible. <clears throat> So in Old Testament history, the way a family was going to be taken care of, by the way, this is canonized in Deuteronomy, that when you had a family, if, the, if a wife, husbands died without children, it was the responsibility of the brother to marry that wife and make sure that that family was taken care of. It's weird, I know, okay? But that's what was expected. And by the way, that's where we get the story of Boaz and Ruth. Everybody with me on that? Okay, so the next son of Judah is to marry Tamar. His name is Onan. Onan does not marry Tamar. He does, or he does not provide a family for Tamar. He too disobeys the Lord. It's quite graphic, verse nine, not suitable for children. I'll let you read it on your own. And the Lord kills him too, okay? So you're seeing a pattern here, right? And so Tamar is now a widow and Judah promises that his much younger son, a son by the name of Shelah, will be her husband once he gets old enough. Think, share, okay? So, uh, thank you. I said that in the last service and no one got it. I thought it was funny. So, um, 
And so Judah's wife now dies. He's now a widower, and it appears in this story of 38, chapter 38, that he's forgotten his promises to Tamar. And so Judah is still running around with people that are not followers of God, and his lost buddies say, hey, let's go to a sheep shearing festival in Hira. Now, if you know anything about Old Testament times, sheep shearing festivals was essentially a big party. It was sex, drugs, and rock and roll, okay? And so he goes to the big party with his friends, and As he's entering the city, Tamar gets word that Judah is coming, and she wants to dress up and remind him of the promises he made that she's supposed to get married to his younger son. As he enters the city, she's got a veil on. Judah thinks that she's a prostitute and sleeps with his daughter-in-law. I'm trying to keep it PG, but this is in the book, okay? He promises to pay her with a sheep, and she says, I don't have the sheep. She says, give, she says, give me something that I can return to you that I know you're going to pay me. And so he gives her a signet ring, a cord, and a staff. Judah goes back home, forgets about Tamar, forgets about the party until word gets to Judah that Tamar is pregnant. And now Judah decides to put his righteous cloak on and he gets angry at Tamar and says she needs to be put to death for her immorality. Judah confronts Tamar about her unfaithfulness, and she says, I got pregnant to whoever this signet ring, cord, and staff belong to. ruh all right? <laughs> and in Genesis chapter 20 through 38, verse 26, Judah says this, and I want you to see this. Then Judah identified them, and he's humbled by this. I really believe this was a turning point in the life of Judah. And he says, she is more righteous than I since I did not give her my son, Shelah. And this is very important. We see repentance in the life of Judah and he did not know her again. And Tamar, the story goes on to tell us, bore twins, Perez, who is in the life of David, who is in the line of the Messiah. And to that, Genesis 38, I say to you all, Merry Christmas, everyone. Okay, so that's in the Matthew 1 story. So... People say that the Bible is boring, are not paying close attention, all right? So here it is. I want to pull a couple things out that I think will encourage you this morning, all right? Number one, nothing can thwart the sovereign plans of God. Nothing can thwart what God is doing. God, since Genesis chapter 3, has set a redemptive plan in motion that will find its conclusion upon the return of Christ. If you've read this book and you read it to the end, you ready for this? God through Christ wins. And you can be on the winning team by grace through faith. Isn't that cool? Why is that important? Listen, I don't think... I don't think this is going to make me the greatest prophet that's ever walked the planet. 2024 is going to be buckle up. Yes? It's going to be buckle up, especially in October and November. You guys are going to come in here and you're going to be thinking, man, the world is out of control. We've got a divided country. There's global war. We've got a presidential election. And some of you are going to come in here and you're going to think, man, God has lost control. Unless we vote for, pick your poison, okay? God has not lost control. God is working in the shadows. And by the way, the reason I think chapter 38 is in the story of Joseph is when you read the story of Joseph, Joseph seems to do everything right He's in Potiphar's house, and Potiphar's wife literally throws herself at him. And he's like, no, 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 I, I got to walk in righteousness and holiness. Joseph gets to prison. He does the right thing. Go, Joseph gets in front of Pharaoh. He does the right thing. Joseph constantly does the right thing. And it's easy to look at the story of Joseph and go, man, God really uses good people. But guess who ends up in the lineage and genealogy of Christ? It's not Joseph. It's Judah and Tamar. And I think what the scriptures is juxtaposing is, would God prefer that we walk in holiness and righteousness? Of course. 
But if you have this sinful past, you're thinking, man, God could never use me, which will be my next point. You are not too far gone for God to use. Like God is still using broken people to bring glory to his name, but it's ultimately about the timing of God. God doesn't always work on the time frame that we want. Like one of the things I love about John chapter 11, right, in the story of Lazarus, it comes, Mary and Martha send word to Jesus, Lazarus is sick, come see him. And Jesus is like, not yet, timing's not right. And by the time he gets there, they're disappointed. Like he wouldn't be dead if you would have shown up on time. And Jesus is like, I'm doing something you can't imagine. Listen, some of you buried a loved one this year. Where's God in that? According to the end of this book, he, Jesus returns and the bones or the ashes of that person are going to be recreated into a body that will live forever. And in the timing of that, the whole world will go, he is God. Amen. You with me? There is time. Even evil cannot, even sin cannot actually thwart what God is doing in his redemptive plans. That's great news. Number two, your past doesn't define your future. Your past doesn't define your future. I love Genesis 38, 26. It says, then Judah identified them and said, like he's, I think he's genuinely convicted here. And we're going to see that in a minute because I'm going to bring him back into the story of Genesis Genesis 44. Judah identifies them and he said, she's more righteous than I for. I did not give her to my son, Shelah. In other words, that was his job. That was what God had taught them and he didn't do it. And he did not know her again. I think there's genuine conviction of sin in this passage for Judah. And I think we see that in this last line where he now walked in righteous obedience. One of the things that Pastor Andrew always says is, he says in an authentic community, we should be able to confess our past and our sins to one another. And we look at each other and go, is that all you got? Like, listen, there is no sin that Jesus' blood didn't pay for. Now, it's easy to clap until I start naming some really uncomfortable particular sins. I'm not going to do that. Listen, I don't, I don't care about your past in some regard. I don't care. What I care about is where you are and where you're going. You can always, 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 always get right with God in any moment. You can always repent of sin and and trust Christ and, and have a whole new family tree. It doesn't matter what your past was. I'm I'm now building on this path. I'm now walking in holiness and righteousness. Yes, back there. If you would have known, and by the way, there's not a single person in this room that hasn't done something in the past that we would not want put up on that screen right there. Yes? There's glimpses, there's hours, there's moments, there's texts, there's things we've said or done. Man, I wouldn't want that video recorded and put up there for everybody to see. I would be humiliated, and so would you. And so guess what? God uses broken people. Praise be to God, right? And by the way, like just to kind of bring, and some of you, by the way, some of you in this service, like you're a first generation Christian. I want to, like, I want to encourage you, like your, your family thinks you're nuts in following Jesus. You're about to get together with them at Christmas and they're going to think you're nuts. I praise God for you. I am the son of a first generation Christian. Okay, And so God, it doesn't, doesn't matter what your family tree was, it's where you're going in Christ. Okay, let me transition quickly to the story of, of Joseph for a minute. So I've got to give you the big picture, so stick with me, it matters, okay? So Joseph, God positions Joseph through his obedience to the Lord and this gift of a dream interpretation. He positions him of being the second in charge of Egypt. Right? So remember, the Pharaoh has a dream. 
Nobody can interpret the dream. The cupbearer and the bread maker remember, oh, there was this guy in prison that interpreted dreams. His name was Joseph. And so he says, bring me Joseph. He doesn't tell Joseph the dream. And Joseph tells him a dream and interprets the dream. He's like, you know, there's gonna be seven years of famine, seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine. And Joseph has a plan. He says, I think we should store up grain for the, during the seven years of famine. And then that way we can sell the plentiful grain during the famine and we can be rich. And, it, and Egypt ended up becoming, because of Joseph's planning the richest na nation on the planet at the time, okay? And so now let's transition to Jacob and Israel. They're in another country. They run out of food. And what does Jacob do? He sends his brothers down to Joseph to buy food. How many of y'all remember this story? How many? Raise your hands high so I know. Okay, because I, I, I'm trying to not go into too much detail, but give you enough. So he goes down to Egypt. The brothers do, but they don't bring the youngest brother, Benjamin, because Benjamin, Jacob has been grieving ever since the loss of Joseph because the brothers lied to him. They told him he died, but they sold him into slavery, right? And so he has this special affinity, Jacob does, to Benjamin. And so they go down to Egypt. They give the money to Joseph. They don't recognize Joseph as their brother. They give the money to Joseph, right? And they come back with the grain and Joseph put the money back in their sacks of grain, right? And so now they're afraid to go back because they're like, they're going to think that Egypt, the Egypt ruler is going to think we stole from them. They run out of food. Jacob says, go back to Egypt and get more food. And the brothers plead with their dad. They're like, we can't. He said, we couldn't come back unless we brought Benjamin. So Joseph was playing with them. He's, 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 he's testing them to see if they've changed. They finally decide, Jacob lets them go with Benjamin back to Egypt, okay? And he puts the grain in the sacks and he, he sets up, Joseph sets up Benjamin to make it look like he stole from him. He puts his personal cup in Benjamin's sack. They leave with the money, with the, with the grain. The soldiers of Egypt capture the brothers from Jacob and they find the, the cup that belonged to Joseph in Benjamin's sack. He brings them back and the brothers know we're in big trouble. Because we, we promised our father that if we would go down and get grain and come back with his beloved son, Benjamin. Are you all with me? Okay, good. Here it is. So then in Genesis 44, verse 33, Judah speaks up. And he says to Joe, he doesn't know it's Joseph. He's standing in front of a guy that's very, very powerful. Can put him to death if he wants to. He says, now therefore... Please, this is Judah speaking, please let your servant remain instead of the boy, Benjamin. At, let me remain as a servant to the Lord. Let the boy go back with his brothers, for how can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? I fear to see the evil that would find my father. Judah is a changed man. He's humble. He's willing to exchange his life to save his brothers. He's honoring to his father. Did Judah mess up? Sure did. Did Judah get right with God? Sure did. Did Judah and Tamar end up in the genealogy of Christ? Sure did. Why do I tell you that? Because God uses broken people doesn't care about your past. He cares about where you're going. And some of you have checked yourself into the penalty box because you think your past sin is a sin that the blood of Christ is not sufficient to pay for. And by the way, that's a form of pride. Humility is, you know what? He paid for all of it. And so I can just go forward in the new family tree. All right, number three, here we go. God chooses his children based on grace and not merit. This is a story about grace. Grace, 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 grace. The story here is all of us are too messed up to be in the family of God. See, a lot of, a, a lot of people, there's two problems here. Some of you have checked yourself into the penalty box. You're not serving the Lord because you're like, well, only good people serve the Lord. And I'm not one of those. No, it's not good people that serve the Lord. It's humble people who have been transformed from the inside out because of the person and work of Jesus. And here's, the, this is the, by the way, this whole idea of good people is who God uses. By the way, that's a double-edged sword because some of you are walking around going, I'm one of those good people. I've got it together. That's why God is using me. And the tensions of the Bible are this cheer up, you're far more sinful than you even imagine. 
and cheer up your far more love than you dare dream. And depending on where your heart posture is, is what side of the gospel you need to preach to your heart, own heart. When you're full of pride and you think, man, I'm one of the good people that God uses, you need to remind yourself that but for the grace of God, there go you. But for the grace of God, your story wouldn't look a whole lot different than Judas. And when you're feeling like, man, I'm a nothing, I'm a nobody, God could never use me, that's another form of pride, by the way. And you're gonna need to preach the gospel. No, what? No, Christ, I am far more loved by God than I ever dared dream. And we, and we go through life with our heart posture t- struggling between these two tensions. And we preach this. And, and, and you're in the family of God. If you're a follower of Jesus here this morning, you're in the family of God because God chose you before the foundations of the world, not because you had it together, but because he loved you. Period. It's Ephesians 1. Look what the Apostle Paul says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Even as he chose us in him, when did he choose us in him, church? Before the what? And what did he choose you to be? To be holy and blameless before him. In love. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself. You're adopted into the family of God. Sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glory with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In Christ we have redemption through his blood, forgiveness of our sin according to the riches of his what, church? Because of his grace he has lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ. Paul goes on to say this in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace you have been saved through what, church? And this, by the way, the word this refers to faith and not grace. This gift of grace, it's not your own doing, it's the gift of God, not as a result of work so that no one can brag about it. If not for grace, my story and your story would look no different than Judah's. I got pregnant by whoever this cord and this signet ring and this staff belongs to. Oh, yeah, that's me. And when we really understand why we're part of the family of God, oh, Christian, we understand, man, it is grace alone. It postures our heart in humility. That makes us a humble people. That God, because he wanted to, set his affections on the likeness of you before the foundations of the world because he loved you. And that is a humbling, humbling truth. And God said to Judah, you're gonna be part of my story. Tamar, you're gonna be part of my story. Why? Because that's how I want this thing to go. Cheer up. You're far more sinful than you ever imagined. And cheer up, you're far more loved than you ever dared dream. Well, these are my fourth point this morning, right? I want to focus on our Savior Jesus. I want you to see the humility of our Savior Jesus Christ. The humility of our Savior Jesus Christ. Jesus' family tree made him an easy target. In John chapter 8, Jesus is arguing with the Jews. By the way, remember, Matthew is written to the Jewish culture to identify Christ as the Messiah. And Jesus is arguing with the Jews, trying to help them understand that salvation with God is spiritual and not ethnic. Everybody with me? And so they're arguing about Abraham. We're children of Abraham. What are they saying? Ethnicity. We got the right bloodline. And Jesus is trying to help them understand, no, this is not about ethnicity. I'm not talking about bloodline Abraham. I'm talking about spiritual Abraham. Jesus is trying to say, God has always had a vision for all the world to be worshipers of God. And true worshipers worship God, John chapter 4, in spirit and in truth, right? And so he's arguing with the Jews, 
Which, by the way, how many of y'all, like, you probably never thought about this before, right? How many of y'all grew up in Sunday school singing, Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham. What's the next line? Okay, let me ask you something. How is it that a bunch of white people from Western European descent go, I am from the downline of a Middle Eastern man, <laughs> and I'm one of them, and so are you. And let's just what? Praise the Lord. Right? That's where it gets weird. Right? What are we doing? Right arm, left arm? I don't know. Anyway. Well, that's actually a really good song. He's, it's teaching us that those who are saved are spiritual Abraham. How many of you right now are like, man, I'm really, really glad he's not on the worship team too. Like, you know, like that's a good thing, huh? And so they're arguing with Jesus, and Jesus says, you're missing the point. I loved Abraham because he walked with me by faith. I want spiritual children of Abraham. And so here's their retort. Oh, yeah? John chapter 8, 41, this is the Jews report. Oh, yeah? Well, we weren't born out of sexual immorality. (laughs) Na, 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 na. (laughs) Take that, Jesus. What are they talking about? They're talking about Jesus' family tree. They're talking about they're talking about bloodlines. Jesus, to save us from our sin and to fulfill Old Testament prophecy, had to be a descendant of David. And so he chose to humble himself to scorn the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the creator of the universe, subjected himself to this kind of ridicule. Family tree ridicule. Oh, yeah? You got Tamar in your bloodline and Judah. Oh, yeah? You got David and Bathsheba in your bloodline. Oh, yeah? You were born of a virgin. Wink, wink. Do you see? You understand the scandal? I mean, listen, when you drive by and when you send out your little Christmas card and it's got Mary with the white halo behind her head, like, oh, she's so pure and wonderful and awesome. Do you understand for Mary and Joseph, this was scandalous. He's, trust us, guys. I know I'm pregnant, but trust us. We didn't touch each other. (laughs) Yeah, right. And it was Jesus, our Savior, who subjected himself to this kind of ridicule so that we might be saved from our sin. Jesus Christ humbled himself. Paul says it this way in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. And as an encouragement to the church, as an encouragement to us, have this mind among yourselves. In other words, Paul's saying, I want you to think like Jesus thought. Think about yourself the way Jesus thought about himself. And how did Jesus think about himself? Philippians 2.5, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. By the way, it's not behavior modification. You can't get this by trying hard. The mind of Christ happens through transformation. You have to turn from sin and believe in Jesus and be transformed by Jesus if you're going to have the mind of Christ. It is yours when you're in Christ. Who though, here's how he thought, who though he was in the form of God, did not, uh, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. I'm an American. I have the Bill of Rights. And you're offending me right now. Or, I have the mind of Christ. Christ did not consider equality with God something to be held on to so firmly, but rather he emptied himself. And how did he empty himself? He took on the form of a servant. He said, I'm a servant to the world. And what did that servanthood look like? He became the likeness of, he took on flesh. Verse 8, being found in human form, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Church, can I just tell you, man, I'm overwhelmed by the humility of our Savior. God didn't need to do any of this. He could have just judged us in our sin and our rebellion. Listen, when you drive by a manger scene in the community and it's all lit up and it's shiny, I want you to look at that manger scene and I want you to think humility. 
Christ humbled himself. Christ did not consider equality with God something to be held on to tightly. And he took on flesh and he thought of, he took on a messy family tree and he took on the scandal of pregnancy before marriage. Think about this. He humbled himself to save us from our sin. Oh, what a savior. And so then the application is pretty obvious, right? Like, who am I? How dare Sean Brown think he's above serving someone else or forgiving someone else or loving someone else? Because guess what? In Christ, man, I, have, I am freed up. And what am I free to do? I am free to humble myself and serve others as Christ humbled himself and served me. Who cares what they call you? Who cares if they know your past? Who cares if they know your family name? In Christ, you have a new family and a new name and a new purpose. That's why Paul says in Philippians 2 verse 1, as he's writing to this church, let's get it, look at this. He says, if you have any encouragement in Christ, then comfort one another from love and any participation in the spirit, any affection or sympathy. He's, Paul writes, complete my joy. How does Paul want his joy to be complete to this church in Philippi? He says, have the same mind, have the same love, be in one accord, one mind, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others as more significant than yourself. That is not only hard to do, it's impossible to do unless you're in Christ. Let each of you look out not only for your own interests, but the interests of what, church? Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Here's the deal, man. When you're transformed by Christ, when you're humble as Christ is humble, the things of the world grow strangely dim. Man, my stuff grows less important. My success, my name in the lights grows less important. My temptations to sin grow less important. And this only happens when we have an unusual family tree. We're grafted into Christ's unusual family tree. But once you're grafted in, you have a new family. You're adopted into a new family. You're given a new name. You're gifted a new family tree. And in Christ, and I want you to hear me, this is how we're going to close this morning. In Christ. You are the sons and the daughters of the Most High God. So, if you're here this morning and you're a dude, in Christ, that makes you a prince. And if you're here this morning and you're in Christ as a female, that makes you a princess of the most high God. I don't care about your past. You have been given a new name in Christ. And my prayer for us as a church is that we too would have the mind of Christ. And that would be lived out in our body, church body, and it would be lived out in the community. As we are quick to give up our rights, quick to humble ourselves, we're quick to forgive, we're quick to serve, and we're quick to love. May we live as children of the Most High God. Amen, church? Okay, let's do this. Let's stand. I'm going to pray over you. We're going to go out singing, worshiping the Savior of ours. Oh, wow. Oh, what a Savior we have. I want to invite the prayer team up. Prayer team's up under the screen. If you're here this morning, you came in and You just need to have some prayer before you leave. Man, they are here for you. If you don't know Christ, if you're here this morning and you think, man, God could never use me. And the blood of Christ paid for every sin and he grafts us into the family, gives you a new name, gives you a fresh start. This prayer team would love to talk to you about how you can have that relationship with Christ. Heavenly Father, I wanna pray over your church. These are some amazing people. God, they're called out. You've called us out. You loved us before the foundation of the earth. You gave us your grace, God. You grafted us into the family tree. And now, God, because we're transformed from the inside out, we have the mind of Christ. 
who did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he humbled himself, became a servant, taking on flesh and dying on a cross. Paul goes on to write there that at the name of Christ, every knee shall bow and shall confess in the earth and under the earth that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. And so God, for this morning, the rocks can be kept silent because we, your children, are gonna praise the name of Jesus. We, your children, are gonna worship the name of Jesus because we recognize, oh, what a Savior. Humble, loving, servant, so that we might be called the children of God. It's an amazing truth. We love you, and now we worship you in song. And it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.